Hi everyone. In section 2.3, we're going to cover the rational numbers, which some of you might know better as fractions. A rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction in the integer form a over b, where a and b are both integers. And as we saw in the last section, we know we can't divide by 0, so b cannot be p0. So you can't have 0 in the denominator. The top part of our fraction is referred to as the numerator, and the bottom number is referred to as the denominator. We call a fraction proper whenever the numerator is smaller than the denominator. So for example, of proper fractions, we have things like 2 thirds, 1 half, negative 7 over 8. These all have are fractions where the numerator is smaller than the denominator, and that makes them what we call a, a proper fraction. If the numerator is equal to or greater than the denominator, then we say that the fraction is improper. So if the numerator is equal to or greater than the denominator, things like 4 thirds, 10 over 7, uh, negative 11 over 2, these ones here would be examples of what we call improper fractions. Again, because the numerator is larger than the denominator. Whenever a fraction is improper, there's an another form that we can put it in, which is also called a, a mixed number. For example, if I have the improper fraction 3 halves, some of us also might recognize this as being the mixed number 1 and 1 half. They both represent the same information. And so with your improper fractions, there's two different forms we can put them in. We can put them in improper form, or we can put them in mixed number form. When we write a, uh, a mixed number, something like, let's say, like 3 and a half, for example, what this means is 3 plus a half. So the first part means we have three whole components, and then we have the fractional part, which is added to it, which is a half, and we just kind of run it together and write it as 3 and a half. We can convert back and forth between proper, excuse me, improper form and mixed number. To change from a improper fraction to a mixed number, all we have to simply do is long division. So for example, I know that 6 divides into 17. It doesn't divide evenly, but it will go in 2 times. 2 times 6 is 12. I subtract, and I get a remainder of 5. To write the mixed number, what you do is you put the, the quotient down, it's 2, so it went in 2 times, and then you write your remainder over your divisor. So this is going to be 2 and 5 sixths. So 17 over 6 is equivalent to the mixed number 2 and 5 sixths. We can do this for another example. If I want to change 23 over 7 into a mixed number, Notice that we can do this because it is an improper fraction. The numerator is larger than the denominator. So we're going to do some long division. 7 does not go into 23, but it can go in 3 times without going over. 3 times 7 is 21. Subtract, we get 2. So for our final answer, the mixed number is going to be the quotient. That's 3 plus remainder over divisor. 3 and two-sevenths. We can go the other direction. Let's suppose we start with a mixed number. We can convert that into a improper fraction by using a process that some people refer to as like around the world. What we do is we multiply the whole part to the denominator. So if we're looking at, let's say, the fraction here, which is two-fifths, we're looking at pieces out of five. Well, if we have seven whole components, that means that we have seven situations where we have pieces of five. So we will do seven times five first, which will give us 30. And if you think of like the division step, that means we also would have had two pieces that were left over. And now, so we now add the numerator, which is two. 30 plus two gives us 32. And that's gonna be the numerator of our improper fraction. 
the denominator is the same as the original denominator in our fraction, which is going to be 5. So 7 and 2 fifths is equal to the improper fraction 32 over 5. Again, to find the numerator, you just multiply the whole part to the denominator and then add the numerator. That will give you the numerator of the improper fraction, and you keep it on top of the original denominator. Let's do the next one. We want to change 10 and 1 fourth to an improper fraction. So I'm going to first start by taking 10 times 4, which will give us 40. We're then going to add the numerator. So then I add 1 to that, and that would give us 41. So our improper fraction should be 41 over 4. Whenever we reduce, we work with fractions, we would like to have them oftentimes in reduced form. A fraction will be in reduced form if the numerator and denominator don't have any common factors. For example, if we look at the fraction 12 over 20, okay, notice that both numerator and denominator have a, G, uh, a greatest common factor of 4. Because of that, we're able to divide both numerator and denominator by that common factor of 4 and that will reduce it to 3 fifths. So even though 12 over 20 and 3 out of 5 are both equivalent fractions, 3 fifths would be the version of it that would be what we call in simplest terms because the numerator and denominator no longer would share any common factors. Let's take a look at example 5. We want to reduce each fraction to the lowest terms. So the very first one, we have 18 over 24. The very best way to do this would be to find the greatest common factor of those two numbers. For 18 and 24, their greatest common factor should be 6, which means that we are able to then go ahead and divide both numerator and denominator by 6. 6 goes into 18 three times. 6 goes into 24 four times, and we get the answer three-fourths. Okay. If you don't recognize the GCF as being 6, maybe you look at this and you say to yourself, well, I know at least 2 can go into both of those numbers. You can reduce this fraction by dividing both top and bottom by 2, and that would produce 9 over 12, which is a simpler version of the original but it's still not in simplest form, namely because both of these now would be able to be divided by, by 3. Right? Because you can take a 3 into both 9 and 12. And it's important that whenever you're reducing fractions, whatever no, no, number you, uh, excuse me, whatever number you divide the numerator by, you must also divide the denominator by exactly the same number. Here, not, 3 goes into 9 three times and 3 goes into 12 four times. So eventually we get down to the same answer anyway. It just took a few more steps. Whereas if you find the GCF in the beginning, then it'll just be one step to get the simplified fraction. Okay. If we look at the example in B, this fraction is already simplified. So there's really nothing to do here. The greatest common... Should be, I said GCF, it should be greatest GCD, greatest common divisor. Or factor, that's correct. Greatest common factor of these two, by the way, 8 and 21, is just 1. There's no number larger than 1 that evenly divides both 8 and 21. And so there's really nothing we can do to reduce this one. It's already in simplest terms. We can also kind of do the reverse process, where maybe we have a fraction that's already in simplest terms, but for one reason or another, we might want to write it as an equivalent fraction that has a, a different denominator. For example, in 6, here we have the fraction 3 eighths, and we're asked to change this to an equivalent fraction, which would be in expressed in terms of 30 seconds. In order to do this, what you can do, well, a couple of different approaches, but one thing we can do is ask the question, well, okay, to go from 8 to 32, what would we need to multiply our denominator by? And the answer is, well, to go from 8 to 32, 
we would need to multiply the denominator by, by 4. But if we multiply the denominator by 4, that means we would also then have to multiply the numerator by 4. We know that 4 times 3 would give us 12, 4 times 8 would give us 32, and so we find out that 3 eighths would be equivalent to the fraction 12 over 32. Let's take a look at the next one. We want to go from 5 over 4 to an equivalent fraction that is expressed in terms of something over 56. In order to do this, we want to ask the question, what would we have to multiply 4 by in order to get 56? That's the same thing as asking how many times does 4 go into 56? That answer is 14 times. Because I'm going to multiply the denominator by 14, that means that we must also multiply the numerator by 14. 5 times 14 would give us 70. So 5 fourths would be equivalent to 70 over 56. The next step we're going to look at is now operations with fractions. When it comes to multiplying fractions, ultimately we will multiply the numerators together and we'll multiply the denominators together. It's also possible to reduce fractions first. When you're multiplying two fractions, you want the original two fractions, first of all, to be in simplest terms first. So if you can reduce either one of your two starting fractions in the beginning, you're allowed to do so. Also, if you have any factors, whether it belongs to either A or C, that are also factors of your denominator, either term B or D, you can divide those out in order to simplify that fraction. For example, if we want to do the multiplication in 5A, which means 7A, notice that the two fractions we're multiplying, there's a common factor in a numerator and a common factor in the denominator, which is namely these two number fives. I can divide top and bottom by five. Five goes into itself once, five goes into itself once, and that will help us to reduce the product. Once you've reduced it as much as you can first, only then should you multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. One times three will give us three. In the denominator, we have eight times one, which is eight, and so we get the answer as three over eight. If we look at example B, right off the bat, we notice that we're multiplying a negative times a positive, so the final answer to this should be negative. So let's write down our sign immediately. Also, there is a factor that's common to both a numerator term and a denominator term, so we can simplify that. Both the 3 and the 9 are divisible by 3. 3 will go into itself once. 3 goes into 9 three times. And now from here, there's no more reducing we can do. The numerator has a factor of 5, but there's no more uh, factors of 5 in the denominator. To finish, we're going to multiply tops and multiply bottoms. 5 times 1 is 5. 3 times 11 is 33. Therefore, our final answer is negative 5 over 33. Here we have another example where we have two mixed numbers that are being multiplied together. In order to multiply these mixed numbers, we want to change them to improper fractions first. To do the 1 and 3 fourths, we do 1 times 4 plus 3. That's going to give us 7 over 4. Times over here, we do 2 times 5 plus 2. That's going to give us 12 over 5. So we convert to improper fractions first. Now that we're here, we notice that we can reduce this. There's a numerator term and a denominator term that have a common factor of 4. So we can divide that out. 4 goes into itself once, 4 goes into 12 three times, and now we can multiply the numerators and denominators together. 7 times 3 is 21, 1 times 5 is, is 5. Okay. As long as you reduce before multiplying, your final answer will come out in, in reduced form. For the majority of questions that we do, I don't care whether you put the answer in improper form 
or in mixed number form. It's entirely up to you. Okay. However, some people would argue that, well, if you look at the, the question the way that it starts with, we start with two numbers that are improper fractions, excuse me, that are mixed numbers. So it might make sense to change our answer so that it also is a uh, mixed number, in which case this would be 4 and 1 fifth. Right. 5 goes into 21 four times, and we have a remainder of, of 1. Okay. So either one of those would be an acceptable final answer. If you left it as 21 over 5, I would be perfectly happy. Um, if you change it to 4 and 1 fifth, that would also be great too. Again, the reason why maybe you want to give it as a mixed number is because that's kind of how the, the, pro, the numbers were in the very beginning. Also, typically, too, had this been an applied or a real-world real world problem, then oftentimes we prefer the, the mixed numbers to the improper fractions. Now that we know how to multiply mixed numbers, we're gonna, or excuse me, fractions, we're going to look at division. But before we do so, we want to talk about the reciprocal of a fraction. If we have a non-zero fraction, let's say that it's A over B, then the fraction B over A, which is found by just flip-flopping it, you just switch the numerator and denominator, is referred to as the multiplic multiplicative inverse or the reciprocal of the original fraction. And the reciprocal is going to be very important and useful when it comes to division. In order to divide fractions, what we're going to do is change the operation of division to multiplication by changing the second fraction that's the one that's actually doing the division, the one that comes across from the division sign, to its reciprocal. Some people use the expression keep, change, flip. So remember this, what that means is we keep the first fraction stays the same. So we don't do anything to the first fraction. A over B stays as A over B. We change the operation. The operation changes from division to multiplication. And the way that we're able to do so is we're flipping the first fraction, just to me the second fraction, into its reciprocal. So keep, change, flip. Another way to say this is that division is simply the multiplication by the reciprocal. And then the thing that's nice is once we have it written as a multiplication problem, that's the thing that we just talked about a few moments ago. So we now know how to multiply two fractions, and therefore we're going to now know how to do division of fractions. For the first example, we have 3 fourths divided by negative 5 eighths. You have to identify the operation first. It's division. So we're going to rewrite it. We're going to do keep, change, and then flip like this. So the problem becomes equivalent to 3 fourths times negative 8 over 5. In order to multiply these fractions, again, we can reduce first. I see that a 4 can go into both of those. 4 goes into itself once. 4 goes into 8 twice. Notice that it's a positive times a negative, so the final answer is going to be negative. 3 times 2 is 6. 1 times 5 is 5. So the final answer should be negative 6 over 5. Let's take a look at the next one, part B. We have 11 divided by 2, divided by the fraction 4 ninths. Again, focus on what is the operation. Here we're dividing. To divide fractions, we rewrite it, keep, change, flip. Now that we've rewritten it, we would like to see if we can simplify anything, but there are no factors of any of the numbers that are also common to factors of the denominator, so we can just multiply the tops and the bottoms together. 11 times 9 is 99, 2 times 4 is, is 8. And we can leave it just like this. Final answer is 99 over 8. The one thing that we haven't required so far that we were, are now going to require when we get into addition and subtraction with fractions is the requirement of having a common denominator. When you add and subtract fractions, 
it's absolutely important that you have to have a common denominator. Yeah. If you have a common denominator, then you can simply perform the work by adding and subtracting the numerators and keeping it over the original denominator. For example, if we look at 9 part A, here we have 5 over 12 plus 11 over 12. Just thinking of, that, of it maybe in terms of like an applied example, if you have five pieces out of 12 of something plus another 11 pieces out of 12 of that thing, that would together give us 5 plus 11 or 16 pieces out of 12. Again, we just add the numerators because the denominators are the same. You add the numerators to get 11 and keep the denominator the same. So the answer is 16 over 12 which, although it's correct, it's not in simplest form. Notice that we can reduce this answer, which we should always do, because both top and bottom have a common factor of, of 4. 4 goes into 16 4 times, 4 goes into 12 3 times, and so the final answer is 4 thirds. Let's take a look over here for part B. We have 7 divided by 3, minus 4 divided by 3. So pay attention to the operation of subtraction. So we need to have a common denominator, which thankfully we do, which means we can simply go ahead and subtract the numerators. 7 minus 4 is going to give us 3 over 3, and we know that any number divided by itself is simply 1. We're now going to investigate what happens when we add fractions or subtract fractions when the denominators are different. When this happens, the very first step is we need to find a common denominator, but in particular, we want to find what's called the least common denominator, which is equivalent to the least common multiple uh, that we talked about earlier. We are then going to rewrite each fraction as an equivalent fraction whose denominator is equal to the LCD. And then that once we have that common denominator, then we can add or subtract the rewritten fractions. And of course, we always want to be careful at the end to make sure that we um, simplify it if needed. Let's take a look at example 10. We want to take an add. So again, pay attention to the operation. We're adding two fractions. We know that whenever we add or subtract, we have to have a, a common denominator. Before, we called it the um, least common multiple. Now we're going to call it the least common denominator. From a previous section, we saw how, saw how to do this with the prime factorization. You can still do that. But the smallest number that both 4 and 6 can divide into is going to be the number 12. What that means is we should be able to rewrite each of these fractions so that they have a common denominator of 12. So let's go ahead and do that. starting with the fraction 1 fourth. If we want to go from a fraction that has a denominator 4 to one that has a denominator of 12, well, then we would need to multiply the 4 by 3. But if I multiply the denominator by 3, then I also have to multiply the numerator by 3, which means that 1 fourth would be equivalent to 3 twelfths. Similarly, if I want to go from a denominator of 6 to a denominator of 12, I would need to multiply the 6 by 2. Therefore, I would need to multiply the numerator by 2, and that will give us 10 out of 12. We've now successfully converted both fractions so that they have the same denominator. Now we can go ahead and perform the addition. We add the numerators together. 3 plus 10 is 13, while keeping the denominator the same. 13 over 12 will not reduce. 13 is prime, and it can't divide any factors of 12. So that is our final answer, 13 over 12. For the next example, we want to take 4 ninths and subtract 2 fifths. Again, focus on the operation. We're subtracting. Anytime we add or subtract, we have to have a common denominator. So let's see if we can find the LCD of 9 and 5. That should be 45. The next thing we need to do is convert each fraction so that it has the 
common denominator. To go from a denominator of 9 to a denominator of 45, we would need to multiply the denominator by 5. Therefore, we also have to multiply the numerator by 5. 5 times 4 will give us 20. For the bottom fraction to go from 5 to 45, we need to multiply by 9. Therefore, we also have to multiply the top by 9, which will give us 18. We now have a common denominator, so we can go ahead and subtract the numerators. 20 minus 18 is 2 out of 45. That is now in simplest terms. So our final answer is 2 out of 45. The next thing we're going to investigate is the relationship between fractions and decimals. Any number that's in fraction form can be converted to a decimal and vice versa. As a quick review, we have our decimal digits and decimal point locations. The decimal point starts here. It separates the whole part of the number from the, the fractional part. Going to the right of the decimal point, it starts off with tenths, then hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, hundred thousandths, etc. To convert a fraction to a decimal, it's just as simple as doing a long division. So if we have the fraction 5 out of 8. This really means take 5 and divide it by 8. Well, we know that it won't go in evenly. Eight, 5 is not divisible by 8. But what we can do is we can add a decimal point here and then add a, a 0. Because 5 is really the same thing as 5.0 where there's no tens associated to it. So while 8 can't divide into 5, 8 can divide into this extended number, which would be 50. 8 would go into 50 6 times. 6 times 8 is 48. We subtract. We get a 2. We can add a 0, which would be the number in the hundredths position, bring it down, and continue this process. 8 goes into 20 2 times. That's 16. Subtract, we get a 4, add a 0, bring it down, and now 8 will go into 45 times, and there's no remainder, so it works out evenly. So our answer to the fraction 5 over 8 is equivalent to 0 0.625. Let's take a look at another one. Let's see if we can write 7 over 20 as a decimal. So for fraction to decimal, we're just doing long division. And we know that seven, 20 cannot go into 7, so I'm going to add a decimal point and add a 0. 20 can go into 70. It's going to go in 3 times. 3 times 20 is 60. Subtract, we get a 1, 0. We can add a 0 and bring it down for the hundredths position. 20 will go into 100 five times. 5 times 20 is 100. We subtract, and again, it works out evenly. So 7 out of 20 is equivalent to 0 0.35. Because we got a 0 remainder for the examples above, we say that these are what we call terminating decimals. A terminating decimal is one that only has a finite number of digits in its decimal representation. So if we continue this on, and if it eventually stops, like these ones did here, where we get a zero remainder, then we say that the decimal terminates or it ends. That's not the case with all fractions. Some fractions have decimal expansions that go on forever, like we're going to see in the next example. Let's write 5 over 6 as a decimal. We would do the same thing. So starting off, we want to take 6 into 5. We know that 6 can't go into 5. But if I add a 0, 6 can go into 50. And it's going to go in 8 times. 8 times 6 is 48. We subtract. 50 minus 48 is 2. 
We can add a zero and bring it down. Six can go into 20 three times. Three times six is 18. Subtract, we get a two. We can add a zero and bring it down. Six goes into 20 three times. That's 18. Subtract, we get a two. Add a zero, bring it down. And if you're paying attention, we kind of see what's going to happen here. Every time we keep doing this division, we're going to keep getting more threes. It's going to be 0 0.8333. 3, 3, and this will never stop. It's going to keep on going, going forever. We call this a repeating decimal. And the way that we would typically write this to indicate that the threes go on forever is you write the digits. So 0 0.8. And the, part, the first part of it that begins the, the repeating pattern, we put a bar over it. So if you see something like 0.83, this would be the fraction 0 0.8 where the threes go on forever. Okay. Be very careful. If I had something kind of closely related, if I had something like this, if I had 0.46 with the bar over both of them, this would be equivalent to 0 0.46. And then it's that part that repeats. So both the four and the six repeat. So it'd be four, six, four, six, four, six, and that would be going on forever. How do we write, and we'll focus on just terminating decimals for the minute. How do we write a terminating decimal as a fraction? Well, the way that we do this is we drop the decimal point from the number and we place the resulting number in the numerator of a fraction. For the denominator, we use, of, uh, we use the power of 10 or the digit space that the last digit in our decimal was under. So if the last digit in your decimal point was in the tenths position, we're going to put the fraction over 10. If the last digit in the terminating decimal was in the hundredth position, then we're going to put the number over 100, etc. Let's take a look at example 14. We want to write each of these as a fraction. For the first one, it's 0 0.8. So we said that you throw away the decimal and just write the number 8. The, the 8 itself is in the tenth position. So what that means is we're going to go ahead and put this over top of 10. So 0.8 is the same thing as 8 over 10. And then the only thing left to do here is to go ahead and reduce it. Both numerator and denominator are reducible by 2. And so we get the final answer of 4 fifths. For the next example, we have 0.65. To change the decimal to a fraction, you throw away the decimal point. You write the number. That's going to be our numerator. And notice that the last digit in this number is in the hundredths position. Because that's in the hundredths position, we're going to put that 65 on top of 100. And then from here, the only thing we need to do is, is to reduce it. Both 65 and 100 are divisible by 5. So we can do this. 5 will go into 65 13 times. It'll go into 120 times and so we get our final answer, 13 over 20. For the next one, we have 0.024. It's the same thing. Throw away the decimal and write the number. We have the number 24. The last digit, which is the 4, is in the tenths, hundredths, thousandths. So we're simply going to take this number and put it on top of a thousand. We want to reduce this again. Both of these have uh, some common factors. In particular, if you check it out, the GCF, not add there, the GCF of 24 and 1,000 is going to be, to be 8. And again, that's something you can work out if you want to take the time, do the prime factorization of each, find it like we showed earlier, but top and bottom are both divisible by 8. 8 goes into 24 three times. And 8 goes into 1,000, uh, let's see, 500, 250, 125 times. So the reduced fraction would be 3 out of 125. We have one more that's actually a, uh, a mixed number, or at least it's a whole number along with a decimal, but it works the same way. 
We're going to go ahead and we're going to throw away the decimal point. Write down the number. So we have 265. And this time, the last decimal digit is in the hundreds position. So we're simply going to take that and put that on top of, of 100. So 2.65 is equivalent to 265 over 100. And now we want to reduce this. Both top and bottom here, the GCF was going to be 5. Five goes into 265 53 times, and five goes into 120 times. So our final answer would be the fraction 53 out of 20. The next thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to go ahead and change a repeating fraction. Um, excuse me, a repeating decimal to a fraction. For this, there's a technique to do it. What I'm going to do is, if I think of this, this point 0.8, this point 0.8 repeating, okay. So 0 0.8 repeating, we know that that's what? 0 0.8, 8, 8, 8, 8, forever. I'm going to let x, so I'm going to use a little bit of a trick here. Let's call x the... Um, 0 0.8 repeating. And now what I'm going to do is I want to find something that's related to this. And I'm going to find the, the expression for 10x. The reason why I'm doing 10x is this digit here, the part that repeats, the last part of the repeating digit is in the tenths position here. So I'm going to multiply this by 10. And if we think about what that does, multiplying by 10, simply would move the, the decimal point. So this is now going to become 8.8 .8 repeating. So if x equals to 0 0.8 repeating, then multiplying it by 10, it shifts the decimal spot to the right, and that's going to give us 8.8 .8 repeating. I can now subtract these two expressions from each other. On the left-hand side, 10x taking away 1x will leave me with, with 9x. And on the right-hand side, if you subtract the whole parts, 8 minus 0 is still going to give us 8. But notice the decimal parts, everything lines up. All of these repeating decimal parts would cancel with these decimal repeating parts. And so that would actually give us 8.0 or just 8. So whatever expression this 0.8 represents... 9 times it equals to 8. And we'll focus more on this in the coming sections, but all we have to do to get x by itself is divide both sides by 9, and we find that x is equal to 8 ninths. And you can very easily check this in your calculator, but if you plug punch in 8 divided by 9, that does give us the 0.8888 repeating. Let's take a look at example 16. We want to change the repeating fraction 0 0.63, excuse me, the repeating decimal 0 0.63 into a fraction. In order to do this, I'm going to call this x. I'm going to call it 0 0.63 bar. Notice that the last part of the repeating portion is in the hundredths position. So in addition to having x, I want to come up with an expression for 100x. Again, because it's all about the, the position of that last repeating portion. 0.63 bar, we know means 0 0.63, 0 0.63, 63, 63, etc. If I multiply that by 100, that's equivalent to shifting the decimal spot two places to the right. So that's going to give us the whole part 63, point, and then the 63 is repeating. So that should be 63.63 .63 bar. I can, again, take these two expressions and subtract them. 100x take away 1x will leave us with 99x's. Over here, if I subtract those two decimals, 63 take away 0 is 63. But the decimal portions will now cancel. This 63 bar part will cancel with this 63 bar part. 
and so it works out evenly to be just 63. So we know that 99x equals to 63. To get x by itself, we can remove that multiplication by 99 by dividing both sides by, by 99. So the fraction that we're working with is actually 63 over 99. That's not our final answer, however, because this is a fraction that can be reduced. Both top and bottom, for example, are divisible by 3. Actually, divisible by 9, excuse me, would be the GCF. 9 goes into 63 7 times, and 9 goes into 99 11 times. So for this one, the final answer would be 7 over 11.